you'll hear three different extracts. For questions 1 to 6, choose the answer A, B or C, which fits best according to what you hear. There are two questions for each extract. Extract 1 You hear a husband and wife discussing family meals. Now look at questions 1 and 2. Where are the kids? In their rooms. Aren't they going to eat with us? They hardly ever do, or hadn't you noticed? Right. Things are going to change around here. I'm making a new rule that this family eats supper together. It's what families do. We can catch up on each other's news and find out what the kids are up to. Good luck with that. Anyway, I have no objection to them just grabbing what they want from the fridge and going back to their rooms. It's less cooking and cleaning up for me. You'd soon get tired of doing it night after night anyway. Maybe, but it's good for them to join in adult conversation. They'll learn things. Before you know it, they'll be out looking for jobs in the adult world, and they need to know how all that goes. They already do, as you well know. What we know is of no interest to them. We're the generation that has made a mess of things, so who are we to speak? Besides, I'm not that fond of formal meals either. Where are the kids? In their rooms. Aren't they going to eat with us? They hardly ever do, or hadn't you noticed? Right. Things are going to change around here. I'm making a new rule that this family eats supper together. It's what families do. We can catch up on each other's news and find out what the kids are up to. Good luck with that. Anyway, I have no objection to them just grabbing what they want from the fridge and going back to their rooms. It's less cooking and cleaning up for me. You'd soon get tired of doing it night after night anyway. Maybe, but it's good for them to join in adult conversation. They'll learn things. Before you know it, they'll be out looking for jobs in the adult world, and they need to know how all that goes. They already do, as you well know. What we know is of no interest to them. We're the generation that has made a mess of things, so who are we to speak? Besides, I'm not that fond of formal meals either. Extract 2. You hear two people talking about modern gadgets. Now look at questions 3 and 4. Hi Joe. I'll get you a coffee and we can do this quiz together. What's it about? Modern life. And the first question is, what modern gadget can't you live without? I'll put you down for smartphone, right? Hey, that's not fair. I know people think I spend most of the day texting and tweeting, but I'm not that bad. Anyway, it's good to keep in touch, and I can't see all my friends every day. Though I'd say it is pretty much a necessity, and I can think of other things equally useful. What about you and your laptop there? That goes where you go 24-7. That's because I'm always working. I don't do social media. Besides, useful doesn't necessarily mean indispensable. Dishwashers, for instance. I've thought about this, and my choice would be glasses. Glasses? Yes, spectacles. I'd be lost without them. Couldn't read or see what's on my laptop. But they're not modern and not a gadget. Well, let's not argue about that. They're the one thing I couldn't do without. Hi, Joe. I'll get you a coffee and we can do this quiz together. What's it about? Modern life. And the first question is, what modern gadget can't you live without? I'll put you down for smartphone, right? Hey, that's not fair. I know people think I spend most of the day texting and tweeting, but I'm not that bad. Anyway, it's good to keep in touch, 
and I can't see all my friends every day, though I'd say it is pretty much a necessity, and I can think of other things equally useful. What about you and your laptop there? That goes where you go 24-7. That's because I'm always working. I don't do social media. Besides, useful doesn't necessarily mean indispensable. Dishwashers, for instance. I've thought about this and my choice would be glasses. Glasses? Yes, spectacles. I'd be lost without them. Couldn't read or see what's on my laptop. But they're not modern and not a gadget. Well, let's not argue about that. They're the one thing I couldn't do without. Extract 3 You hear two people talking about cycling. Now look at questions 5 and 6. Hi, Mary. You came by bike, I see. You must be crazy. You're taking your life in your hands when you cycle in the city. No, oh, it's not so bad. I know the accidents get a lot of press, but it's not as dangerous as they say. It'll be even better when they get all the new cycle lanes done and I can ride anywhere in town without worrying about some idiot driver knocking me down and claiming he didn't see me. You should try it. It's the best way to get about town. You can get to places much quicker. No waiting for buses, avoiding traffic jams, and it keeps you fit and healthy. It would be a much better place to live if everyone cycled. We'd have a pollution-free city with a healthy population. You do paint a rosy picture, but sorry to be a grouch, I think it will just create more problems. To create the cycle lanes, they have to narrow the roads, causing that much more congestion. And anyway, you'll never get most people to give up their cars, at least not until they have a more efficient and cheap transport system. Hi, Mary. You came by bike, I see. You must be crazy. You're taking your life in your hands when you cycle in the city. No, oh, it's not so bad. I know the accidents get a lot of press, but it's not as dangerous as they say. It'll be even better when they get all the new cycle lanes done and I can ride anywhere in town without worrying about some idiot driver knocking me down and claiming he didn't see me. You should try it. It's the best way to get about town. You can get to places much quicker. No waiting for buses, avoiding traffic jams, and it keeps you fit and healthy. It would be a much better place to live if everyone cycled. We'd have a pollution-free city with a healthy population. You do paint a rosy picture, but sorry to be a grouch, I think it will just create more problems. To create the cycle lanes, they have to narrow the roads, causing that much more congestion. And anyway, you'll never get most people to give up their cars, at least not until they have a more efficient and cheap transport system. That's the end of part one. Now turn to part two. You will hear a man called Fred Willoughby talking about his job as an auctioneer. For questions 7 to 14, complete the sentences with a word or a short phrase. You now have 45 seconds to look at part two. Good morning, everybody. My name's Fred Willoughby, and I'm here to tell you a bit about being an auctioneer, my profession for the past 20 years. Where to begin? One of the popular images of an auctioneer, got from TV shows, 
is of a man gabbling incomprehensively at high speed as the bids fly. And it is true in that it can be a strain on the voice. Another image might be more refined, of an auctioneer at one of the great auction houses such as Sotheby's or Christie's, where art can sell for millions. The reality for most of us is somewhere in between. Basically, auctioneers manage public sales where property or merchandise is sold to the highest bidder. These items can be anything from houses to dolls, from farm equipment to jewellery, furniture, exotic animals, antiques and fine art. Anything really that people want to sell. Some auctioneers specialise, for example in antique furniture, but that usually comes after an apprenticeship. Or if they work for a business, for example an estate agent that specialises in property. Most of us begin by travelling the country and finding ourselves in church halls, barnyards, even car parks selling whatever needs to be sold. So, what skills are required? It used to be usual for people to get into the business straight after school, but now more and more are taking courses at college or university. What sort of thing do they study? Well, recommended courses these days include economics, accounting, management, psychology and public speaking. I've also heard people say that a course in acting would be extremely useful too. Business skills are important. Remember, you must be able to value accurately what an item is worth, gauge how much it will fetch at auction and control the bidding so that it attains the sale price or, preferably, exceeds it. Keeping the bidding ticking along nicely is important, as is keeping the bidders happy. I work for an auction house now, and we make our money by taking a percentage from both buyer and seller. So to keep the sale room bidding, because it can get a bit quiet, the auctioneer has to keep them entertained. You need to become a bit of a stand-up comedian when the need arises. You also need great powers of concentration and a keen eye during the bidding process. Some people don't like others to know they're bidding and just make the tiniest nod of the head or twitch of a finger to show they are, which are difficult to notice, especially when you've got upwards of a hundred people there. It can also cause problems when you close the bidding and someone then claims they've got the last bid and you fail to register it. Then you need all your man management skills. But when the bidding gets going and it turns into a battle of wills between rival bidders, then it becomes fascinating and exciting. Now you'll hear part two again. Good morning, everybody. My name's Fred Willoughby, and I'm here to tell you a bit about being an auctioneer, my profession for the past 20 years. Where to begin? One of the popular images of an auctioneer, got from TV shows, is of a man gabbling incomprehensively at high speed as the bids fly. And it is true in that it can be a strain on the voice. Another image might be more refined, of an auctioneer at one of the great auction houses such as Sotheby's or Christie's, where art can sell for millions. The reality for most of us is somewhere in between. Basically, auctioneers manage public sales where property or merchandise is sold to the highest bidder. These items can be anything from houses to dolls, from farm equipment to jewellery, furniture, exotic animals, antiques and fine art. Anything really that people want to sell. Some auctioneers specialise, for example in antique furniture, but that usually comes after an apprenticeship. Or if they work for a business, for example an estate agent that specialises in property. Most of us begin by travelling the country and finding ourselves in church halls, barnyards, even car parks selling whatever needs to be sold. So, what skills are required? It used to be usual for people to get into the business straight after school, but now more and more are taking courses at college or university. What sort of thing do they study? Well, recommended courses these days include economics, accounting, management, psychology and public speaking. I've also heard people say that a course in acting would be extremely useful too. 
Business skills are important. Remember, you must be able to value accurately what an item is worth. Gauge how much it will fetch at auction and control the bidding so that it attains the sale price or, preferably, exceeds it. Keeping the bidding ticking along nicely is important, as is keeping the bidders happy. I work for an auction house now, and we make our money by taking a percentage from both buyer and seller. So to keep the sale room bidding, because it can get a bit quiet, the auctioneer has to keep them entertained. You need to become a bit of a stand-up comedian when the need arises. You also need great powers of concentration and a keen eye during the bidding process. Some people don't like others to know they're bidding and just make the tiniest nod of the head or twitch of a finger to show they are, which are difficult to notice, especially when you've got upwards of a hundred people there. It can also cause problems when you close the bidding and someone then claims they've got the last bid and you fail to register it. Then you need all your man management skills. But when the bidding gets going and it turns into a battle of wills between rival bidders, then it becomes fascinating and exciting. That's the end of part two. Now turn to part three. You will hear a radio discussion in which two writers, Tom Blake and Sally Beecham, talk about their careers. For questions 15 to 20, choose the answer A, B, C or D, which fits best according to what you hear. You now have 70 seconds to look at part 3. Good morning. In the studio with me today are two writers who have both made a name for themselves and won some of the top prizes, but became professional writers by quite different routes. First you, Tom. What made you want to become a writer? I could say that I always wanted to be a writer, but for a long time I had no idea of what I wanted to do as a career. But it was always there in my mind. I was an avid reader, as all writers are but I didn't get down to any serious writing until after I left school. I couldn't understand those children at school who knew from the age of, say, 13 or 14, exactly what career they wanted to follow, be it lawyer, doctor, banker, soldier, and there were several of those. I went to the kind of school where middling income and military types sent their sons. Many were following going into the family business. I thought, you're too young to decide now. You need to go out there and try different things before you decide. And did you? Well, I have done several kinds of job, mainly menial, as did some of my writing heroes, but that was from economic necessity. You see, at first I had this romantic notion of what a writer's life was like. I had been reading the American writers of the early and middle 20th century, Hemingway, Fitzgerald and so on, and they seemed to have a wonderful time. If you read their biographies, it seems that all they did was have parties and travel to exotic places and meet interesting people. That's the life for me, I thought. I was slow to ask questions like when they found the time to write and where the money came from, but I got there in the end. What about you, Sally? Is it something you always wanted to do? Yes, it was. I'm a bit like one of Tom's schoolmates who followed in their father's, both parents in my case, footsteps. They were journalists, not novelists, 
but writing was part of our lives. I just seemed to have absorbed it and started writing a diary as soon as I could put pen, or rather crayon, to paper. Soon it felt like a bad day if I hadn't written something. At that age, the world was a marvel, full of wonders and strange, to a child, goings-on. It still is. Now, you've both been journalists at one time or another. Was that helpful to you as a fiction writer? I wasn't a journalist who went out hunting for stories. I was asked to review one or two books after my first novel was published. The editor liked what I'd done and I got a weekly column. It's helpful in that it keeps me in the loop about what's going on in contemporary fiction, but the downside is it takes up time that should be spent writing my own stuff. And time is at a premium because I have two young children and that's pretty much a full-time job in itself. On the plus side again, it keeps my critical faculties sharp because you have to be a good critic of your own work. And the money helps, of course. You can't live off what your fiction earns you unless you're a bestseller. You need a regular income, especially with a family. Tom. Yes, you need a steady flow of cash, even though I've managed to avoid the pram in the hallway, a famous enemy of promise. Was journalism helpful? I think so, yes, and I still take on assignments when offered them when I need the cash. I think it helps in that with news stories you should keep out the personal. It's not about you or how you feel, but about others and the world at large. You get to know a lot more about the variety of life and other cultures firsthand than you ever could if you just sat at your desk conjuring up imaginary worlds. Don't get me wrong, some great novels have been written that way, but I think writing is enriched by greater experience. But I think too many writers these days are self-absorbed and their books shine a light on little more than their personalities, which may or may not be interesting. Well, we each do what we can to cultivate the patch of ground we've been given to cultivate. I went straight from school to do a creative writing course at university and my first novel was published shortly after that. So I haven't seen as much of the world as Tom or experienced the dangers he has covering disaster areas. I wasn't including you in that category. You have the talent to go with the craftsmanship of the true writer. I'm still dreaming of parties and exotic travel. I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you there as we've run out of time. Thank you both for joining us at this early hour. Now you'll hear part three again. Good morning. In the studio with me today are two writers who have both made a name for themselves and won some of the top prizes, but became professional writers by quite different routes. First you, Tom. What made you want to become a writer? I could say that I always wanted to be a writer, but for a long time I had no idea of what I wanted to do as a career. But it was always there in my mind. I was an avid reader, as all writers are but I didn't get down to any serious writing until after I left school. I couldn't understand those children at school who knew from the age of, say, 13 or 14, exactly what career they wanted to follow, be it lawyer, doctor, banker, soldier, and there were several of those. I went to the kind of school where middling income and military types sent their sons. Many were following going into the family business. I thought, you're too young to decide now. You need to go out there and try different things before you decide. And did you? Well, I have done several kinds of job, mainly menial, as did some of my writing heroes, but that was from economic necessity. You see, at first I had this romantic notion of what a writer's life was like. I had been reading the American writers of the early and middle 20th century, Hemingway, Fitzgerald and so on, and they seemed to have a wonderful time. If you read their biographies, it seems that all they did was have parties and travel to exotic places and meet interesting people. That's the life for me, I thought. I was slow to ask questions like when they found the time to write and where the money came from, but I got there in the end. What about you, Sally? Is it something you always wanted to do? Yes, it was. I'm a bit like one of Tom's schoolmates 
who followed in their fathers, both parents in my case, footsteps. They were journalists, not novelists, but writing was part of our lives. I just seemed to have absorbed it and started writing a diary as soon as I could put pen, or rather crayon, to paper. Soon it felt like a bad day if I hadn't written something. At that age, the world was a marvel, full of wonders and strange, to a child, goings-on. It still is. Now, you've both been journalists at one time or another. Was that helpful to you as a fiction writer? I wasn't a journalist who went out hunting for stories. I was asked to review one or two books after my first novel was published. The editor liked what I'd done and I got a weekly column. It's helpful in that it keeps me in the loop about what's going on in contemporary fiction. But the downside is it takes up time that should be spent writing my own stuff. And time is at a premium because I have two young children and that's pretty much a full-time job in itself. On the plus side again, it keeps my critical faculties sharp because you have to be a good critic of your own work. And the money helps, of course. You can't live off what your fiction earns you unless you're a bestseller. You need a regular income, especially with a family. Tom. Yes, you need a steady flow of cash, even though I've managed to avoid the pram in the hallway, a famous enemy of promise. Was journalism helpful? I think so, yes, and I still take on assignments when offered them when I need the cash. I think it helps in that with news stories you should keep out the personal. It's not about you or how you feel, but about others and the world at large. You get to know a lot more about the variety of life and other cultures firsthand than you ever could if you just sat at your desk conjuring up imaginary worlds. Don't get me wrong, some great novels have been written that way, but I think writing is enriched by greater experience. But I think too many writers these days are self-absorbed and their books shine a light on little more than their personalities, which may or may not be interesting. Well, we each do what we can to cultivate the patch of ground we've been given to cultivate. I went straight from school to do a creative writing course at university and my first novel was published shortly after that. So I haven't seen as much of the world as Tom or experienced the dangers he has covering disaster areas. I wasn't including you in that category. You have the talent to go with the craftsmanship of the true writer. I'm still dreaming of parties and exotic travel. I'm afraid I'm going to have to stop you there as we've run out of time. Thank you both for joining us at this early hour. That's the end of part three. Now turn to part four. Part four consists of two tasks. You will hear five short extracts in which people give their views about London. Look at task one. For questions 21 to 25, choose from the list A to H what they like most about living in London. Now look at task 2. For questions 26 to 30, choose from the list A to H what their reason was for leaving London. While you listen, you must complete both tasks. You now have 45 seconds to look at part 4. Speaker 1 I lived in London for 10 years, and I'll never forget the feeling when I first arrived down from Scotland. 
London was exciting and I loved its energy and the cultural mix and how it seemed at ease with itself. The way you can be private and social at the same time. You can go anywhere on your own and still feel a part of the whole buzz. I also liked how, back then, each place had its own identity, and it's a pity that some areas are losing this identity, as people can't afford to live there any longer. It was when it was time for my daughter to go into secondary education that I decided it was time to go and we moved up north. When I visit now, I'm stunned by the speed of things. Everybody's in a hurry and everywhere's crowded, but it's still exciting. Speaker 2 Did you know that about 300 languages are spoken in London? I just love the multiculturalism of the city, and I miss it. Everything happens in London, which is a shame, really, because it means that people have to go there to make a career for themselves, especially if they're writers, artists or musicians. This means other cities around England are losing a lot of talented people. I live in the country now. I moved after a local doctor told me how many local people had lung disease from the pollution. I like to go jogging and I thought, well, time to go. And I miss the fact that at any time of day or night you just open the front door and there's always somewhere to go and something to do. I could live there again, but they'd have to make the road safer for pedestrians and cyclists. Speaker 3 Moving away from a place can give you some perspective and there are things that didn't bother me when I lived there but would now. A big problem then as now is accommodation and even though I was quite well paid I couldn't afford a decent flat in the centre where I wanted to be. I ended up having to commute from the suburbs. Still, it was an exciting time to be young, isn't it always, in a world city? The music scene was fantastic and London is more fast-moving and open to difference than any other European city I've been to. It's that openness to popular culture that I love and it's one of the intellectual centres of the world. But getting around in London is a nightmare. The underground is overpriced, overcrowded and confusing. In fact, the whole transport system is a mess. I've been posted by the paper I work for to a city where all that works and is a lot cheaper. Speaker 4 I like London better now when I visit than I did when I lived there. I was young, recently married and poor, so didn't really get to savour all that London had to offer. I came, as many do, because it's where things happen, where you can make a name for yourself, and it's where the jobs are. I was young, as I said, and ambitious. We lived in the suburbs because we couldn't afford to live more centrally, and I had a 90-minute commute into work. That grinds you down. We said to each other, this isn't really working, is it? Life hasn't improved much by moving here. So we decided to leave. Now that I have money, it's a different prospect altogether. London really is where everything is happening, and if you want theatres, restaurants, good music of every kind and so on, it's the place to be. As a visitor, my one complaint would be that it's not pedestrian-friendly. Speaker 5 It is the place to be, isn't it? I loved it when I lived here, even though it was a bit of a struggle financially. But it's the people you meet and the contacts you make that are so important. So many interesting and creative people. It's inspiring. The trouble is, I'm really an outdoors person and like living where there are open spaces and fresh air. And as a surfer, I like to be as near the sea as possible. That's why I moved down to the coast. Despite all that's been done to combat it, pollution levels are still high there. Another problem for me, as for many people, was how incredibly expensive it was to get a decent flat. Rents were through the roof. It bothered me too, when I was there at least, that there were so many homeless people on the streets. It's still a problem and that should be a priority for the government.
Now you'll hear part four again. Speaker one. I lived in London for ten years, and I'll never forget the feeling when I first arrived down from Scotland. London was exciting, and I loved its energy and the cultural mix and how it seemed at ease with itself. The way you can be private and social at the same time. You can go anywhere on your own and still feel a part of the whole buzz. I also liked how back then each place had its own identity, and it's a pity that some areas are losing this identity as people can't afford to live there any longer. It was when it was time for my daughter to go into secondary education that I decided it was time to go, and we moved up north. When I visit now, I'm stunned by the speed of things. Everybody's in a hurry, and everywhere's crowded. But it's still exciting. Speaker two. Did you know that about three hundred languages are spoken in London? I just love the multiculturalism of the city, and I miss it. Everything happens in London. Which is a shame, really, because it means that people have to go there to make a career for themselves, especially if they're writers, artists, or musicians. This means other cities around England are losing a lot of talented people. I live in the country now. I moved after a local doctor told me how many local people had lung disease from the pollution. I like to go jogging, and I thought, well, time to go. And I miss the fact that at any time of day or night, you just open the front door, and there's always somewhere to go and something to do. I could live there again, but they'd have to make the roads safer for pedestrians and cyclists. Speaker three. Moving away from a place can give you some perspective, and there are things that didn't bother me when I lived there, but would now. A big problem then, as now, is accommodation, and even though I was quite well paid, I couldn't afford a decent flat in the centre where I wanted to be. I ended up having to commute from the suburbs. Still, it was an exciting time to be young, isn't it? Always in a world city, the music scene was fantastic, and London is more fast moving and open to difference than any other European city I've been to. It's that openness to popular culture that I love, and it's one of the intellectual centres of the world. But getting around in London is a nightmare. The underground is overpriced, overcrowded, and confusing. In fact, the whole transport system is a mess. I've been posted by the paper I work for to a city where all that works and is a lot cheaper. Speaker four. I like London better now when I visit than I did when I lived there. I was young, recently married, and poor, so didn't really get to savor all that London had to offer. I came as many do because it's where things happen, where you can make a name for yourself, and it's where the jobs are. I was young, as I said, and ambitious. We lived in the suburbs because we couldn't afford to live more centrally, and I had a ninety-minute commute into work. That grinds you down. We said to each other, "This isn't really working, is it? Life hasn't improved much by moving here." So we decided to leave. Now that I have money, it's a different prospect altogether. London really is where everything is happening, and if you want theatres, restaurants, good music of every kind, and so on, it's the place to be. As a visitor, my one complaint would be that it's not pedestrian friendly. Speaker five. It is the place to be, isn't it? I loved it when I lived here, even though it was a bit of a struggle financially. But it's the people you meet and the contacts you make that are so important. So many interesting and creative people. It's inspiring. The trouble is, I'm really an outdoors person and like living where there are open spaces and fresh air. And as a surfer, I like to be as near the sea as possible. That's why I moved down to the coast. Despite all that's been done to combat it, pollution levels are still high there. Another problem for me, as for many people, was how incredibly expensive it was to get a decent flat. 
rents were through the roof. It bothered me too, when I was there at least, that there were so many homeless people on the streets. It's still a problem and that should be a priority for the government. That's the end of part four.